thanks, Jasper. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present here today. And uh, we'll look forward to the Q&A session after we go through our presentation. So uh, Inplay Oil is a, is a company that uh, started in 2012, late 2012, uh, but really didn't get going until 2013, late 13 and into 2014. We started privately after a very, very successful um, public company before called Vero Energy, where we grew production pretty much through the drill bit from 600 BUEs a day to uh, north of 11,000, sold our gas off, assets off just before uh, natural gas uh, crashed in early 2012. And we uh, um, came up with an oil package that we grew from 1,000 barrels to 2,400 barrels in less than a year and, and sold that as well at a very opportune time uh, that, that actually did very well for most shareholders. Um, so then we started in play oil privately uh, in late 2012, uh, not a great acquisition year in 13, and that's what you got to do as a private company or as a, as a junior company is, is acquire to start usually. Um, but really got going in 2014. Of course, there was significantly higher oil prices at that time, but we, uh, uh, we did a pretty good job putting together around 1,500 BOEs a day, predominantly oil weighted, which was our focus. Now we went through um, the oil price coming off significantly in 15 and 16 to a very uh, unwanted oil market or a crude market or oil and gas market in, uh, uh, in those next few years. Um, ultimately, we get a reverse takeover uh, of a company that was public. Um, that closed in November of 2016, which ultimately, um, you know, we started trading on the Toronto Stock Exchange November 10th of 2016. Uh, our track record of what we've done is is very strong since that time frame, and uh, I got some great slides that I'm going to go uh, over uh, about our historical track record. Now, um, you know, with that said, you know, I, I know there's lots of ups and downs in, in our industry, but I'm uh, very bullish. I believe we're in a multi-year oil cycle here. Um, right now, we've got a little bit of a reprieve. I mean, uh, typically the, the, the oil and gas sector is, is strong at the beginning of a cycle and gets, again, stronger through mid and, and through the, the end of a cycle. Well, we had a really strong 21 and 22 after COVID. And uh, we're in a bit of a uh, show me mode of, of where crude pricing and gas pricing is going to go over the next little while. Ultimately, um, due to the lack of capital being spent and the discipline being showed by uh, producers for return to shareholders uh, instead of growth for growth's sake and the disciplines uh, being shown by OPEC Plus, I think we are in a, a very long term commodity bull cycle for uh, the oil and gas sector. So that said, let's jump into uh, to in play. I mean, I'm a technical, we're a technical focus team. We have an eight year track record of delivering what I would consider top, top tier per share growth amongst my, uh, my oil weighted peers. Um, you know, we've done some great acquisitions in the last few years. That's uh, strategic accretive acquisitions. That's made us a more sustainable company and, and it's provided us with a, a really strong balance sheet today. In fact, um, you know, I've never been below one times debt to EBITDA for any length of time uh, with over 17, 18 years uh, as an executive uh, and the majority of that as a CEO of a company. And then and we are focused on continued top tier um, light oil growth is our is our focus uh, with the liquids coming with the natural gas and providing return to shareholders. That's what they're asking for. That's what we want to give. 2022 was a great year for us. We provided top tier production per share uh, growth amongst our light oil peers. We had significant de debt reduction. In fact, we, we reduced our debt by 59% and we ended the year at a record low 0.2 times net debt to EBITDA. And we delivered our initial return of capital to shareholders. So we implemented a NCIB or, or a share buyback program. And in November, a monthly dividend of 1.5 cents a share or 18. Uh, cents on a per yearly basis. So 1.5 cents per month. We had records across the board, but it, you know, in all reality, it was a hugely strong commodity year. We had 51% debt adjusted production per share growth uh, and, you know, strong funds flow and record free funds flow paying down that debt and starting that, uh, that dividend and uh, buyback program. So our strategy in 23 
and going forward is, is still continued top tier production per share growth, strong free funds flow generation, conservative leverage ratios, and ultimately increasing the returns to the shareholders. Our guidance uh, is between 95 and 10,000 BVs a day and increasing our liquids production from where we were last year by focusing on oilier properties. So we hope to increase our liquids production three to 5% over last year. That's gonna be 80% of our revenue driver, especially in a year like this when you have a lower uh, natural gas uh, price tape uh, as we kind of predicted. But that's gonna be very strong light oil growth, you know, somewhere in the low to mid teens which again, maximizes our funds flow. Really quickly, again, we talked about our guidance, 9,500 to 10,000 BUEs a day, uh, starting to push 60% uh, light oil and natural gas liquids. That's, um, you know, again, three and a half to five and a half percent growth over 2022 on the, on the liquids weighting or increase, I guess. Drilling 17 to 18 net horizontal wells. We have a very strong reserve book. I have another slide and we'll talk about that um, with a strong proof plus probable uh, present value before tax 10% of 884 million. Bookings of 63% oil and natural gas liquids. We have about 80, just under 89 million basic shares outstanding, 93 million fully diluted. At 260 a share, it's about a 230 million Canadian market cap. Uh, about 277 million enterprise value at the end of the first quarter of this year. Again, that monthly dividend at 260 is just under 7% uh, yield uh, on 18 cents a year. We believe that's sustainable to a long-term $55 WTI forecast. Employees and directors own about 6.1%. Uh, I'm about two and a half percent of that. And we have some, we have one large inside shareholder that's on the board of 22.6%. Uh, we ended Q1 with a net a bank debt of 31.1 million drawn on a $110 million credit facility and about 46.2 million uh, of uh, net debt. So it's a very active first quarter in Canada um, due to the Q2 usually being quite a bit less active due to uh, what we call spring breakup, which is uh, uh, the freezing of the ground and the frost coming out of the ground and hard to, to get around without uh, making a mess of, of roads uh, throughout the province. So uh, limited access at times. We have a very, very strong technical and value creation management team. Uh, of course, myself uh, at the top there, I'm an engineer uh, by trade. Um, Kevin Yakachuk, our vice president of, of exploration, uh, we have worked together since the late 90s. Um, so uh, we started Barrow Energy. We also started um, InPlay Oil together as a group. Gord Reese, uh, uh, our most senior statesman there, uh, Vice President of Business Development. Uh, he's been around for many years uh, and has done pretty much seen every, every side of the basin as we sit right now. Of course, Darren Dittmer is our CFO, um, so a non-technical person. Uh, uh, very, very strong uh, on that side of the business. And then ultimately, Brent Howard has just replaced Thane Jensen, um, our, our original VP of, of operations, um, who has, uh, has retired. Brent has uh, um, strong experience uh, in the industry. Uh, he came over with as a manager of operations with our acquisition of Prairie Storm in late 2021, and we've been grooming him for this position upon Thane's retirement uh, since November of 2021, uh, since he came over. Really strong, uh, experienced, I would say savvy industry board. Um, Regan Davis has been worked at all facets of the industry. He's an engineer by trade. He's uh, worked on the on the oil and gas EMP side. He's worked on the service side. Uh, Joan Dunn's an accountant who's uh, many, many years as CFOs of, of well-known companies in, uh, in Canada. Um, Craig Golanowski, uh, he is the representative of Carbon Infrastructure Partners, so our biggest shareholder. He's chairman of the board. He's got uh, he's in control of about twenty two and a half percent. Been a great shareholder, uh, um, you know, and very very strong on the uh, on the capital market side. Steve Nikiforic, um, again chair of our audit committee. Uh, he's chair of White Cap Audit Committee, so a well known strong company in Canada. And then Dale Schwed, president of Crew Energy, uh, been around a long time. A geologist with just Unbelievable experience across the board. This is my favorite chart by far. This is our um, what we've done since we went public in 2016. And again, I, our historical track record of top tier growth, debt reduction, um, 
is is top tier here. Now, if you take a look at the top left, that is our production um, per share growth, with the light green being our oil, our light oil and our natural gas liquids, the orange being our natural gas. Now, you can see really stub year was less than two months in 2016, so it's kind of the fourth quarter there. Um, but 17, 18, 19, consistent growth throughout that time frame. And that was all within our cash flow. It's within our means. That's top tier. Now, the blue boxes is our production per million shares of growth. Again, ultimately, if you're growing your production, your reserves on a per share basis, if you don't blow up the balance sheet and, and have too much debt doing it, um, you're going to create value for your shareholders. And I think we've done a good job with that historically, and it's going to be great going forward. You can see 2020 on the production side. Of course, we all know what happened there was, uh, um, you know, outside of hospitality and, and, and air, air, the air industry, the oil and gas industry was one of the hardest hit due to the, the severe black swan event demand destruction that occurred during that time frame. So it was survive. That's what we did. In fact, we not only did we survive, we thrived through that uh, period. And then you can see strong growth back in 21. In fact, 5,750 BBs a day in 21 versus 5,000 barrels a day in 2019. Very few companies uh, were able to do that. And then you can see that production per share growth with the blue boxes was phenomenal through 21 and 22. And as we go to 21, 22, less production per share growth, but higher on the light oil and NGL base you know, of 11 to 16%. So again, I believe that'll be top tier, specifically organic drill, drill bit type growth. You know, same thing on the top right on our reserves. You know, we were growing our reserves anywhere from 6 to 12%. Uh, through 16 into into 2019. Um, in 2020, we did a fabulous little acquisition at $45 oil in a very tough lending capital markets environment late in the year. And that increased our reserves, which a lot of guys were not even able to show positive reserves in 2020. And then, of course, in 21, we did another acquisition of a corporate deal, Prairie Storm Energy Corp., which closed November 30th. Um, and you can see, again, a big upgrade in our reserves. And then organic, no acquisition year, like back to our kind of 6 to 12% uh, uh, growth in our reserves in 2022. Very, very strong reserve growth. Bottom left, how do you look at this uh, on, a, on, a, on a financial basis? And I mean, that is our, our adjusted funds flow. And if you take a look at 17, 18, and 19, the green columns, you know, that's our whole number of, of funds flow you know our record year was about 32 million in 2019 the blue boxes is, is our funds flow per share so we were growing it every year 2020 as i said just survived and we did then we had record funds flow of just under 50 million in 2021 um, you know funds flow per share of 60 60 plus uh, cents per share uh, at that time frame and, a, and just a great year in 22. And again, let's put it in perspective. 22 was, you know, one of the best commodity years we've seen in ages. Q2 of that year was the best commodity uh, quarter I've ever been involved with in my 30 plus years in the industry. How does that relate to leverage in the, on the right side? Well, you know what? In 17, we were 1.9 times debt to EBITDA. In 18, we were 1.8 times. In 19, we were 1.6 times. You know what? That's how we always used to run our businesses. But that's changed. The access to capital has changed. The access to debt's different. 21, after COVID, we got it down to 1.5 and ended 0.2 times debt to EBITDA on 22. 23, um, you know, on our current forecast, we're ending the year 0 to 0 0.2 times uh, through our, our production ranges and in our current commodity type assumptions. So unbelievable leverage reduction through that time frame. So running a really strong business through uh, lots of ups and downs from the time we went public in 16 uh, until current. You know, our year-end reserves, I think the, the key pieces on this is growth in all categories. Our proved developed producing case on the year-end price deck is over $3 per share. Uh, we're currently trading below that. So that's our blowdown case. If you did drill another well, your net asset value is $3.18 a share. On a proved basis, so that's adding uh, extra undeveloped locations um, with a 
probability of 90% is about $7.20 a share. Um, so again, we're in deep value. Um, with the yield, you got to wait while uh, the, the, the industry changes over time here. And we did hit over $5 in June of last year. Um, so again, you know, strong upside to a, what I would con consider um, having a much more favorable um, commodity tape on the uh, oil side specifically, but oil and, and natural gas as well. You know, we, we, we have just our finding costs uh, as a company. And last year we were $15, no acquisitions, 24 on a total approved basis, 15 on approved developed producing, $27 on approved plus probable. Uh, still providing strong economics of adding reserves. But our three-year average is top of our peer group. And in all reality, you know, I, I have peer averages, um, you know, on the far right. We are significantly below the peer average, and I'll show it on the next slide. In the very top left corner, this is our addition of reserves in 2022 on a PDP uh, finding development acquisition costs basis. We were number three. Now, if you take a look at the three-year average on the proved developed producing on the bottom, we're number one. On 2022, top right corner, on a total proof, so using some undeveloped locations, we are number three in that case. And on the three-year average, though, we're still number one in total proof finding development and acquisition costs versus our peers. So we've been adding reserves very very uh, economically, um, you know, which has, again, provided us good returns and, and a much more sustainable company um, with these smart acquisitions and our drilling program. So, our, you know, our long-term forecast right now, we've got a three-year forecast out to the end of 2025. So, again, we continue to believe we're providing top-tier production per share growth and free funds still generation. Now, you know, at $80, we're closer to 10% growth. At $60, we're close to 6% 6 growth. Now, again, it depends a little bit on, on oil and gas weighting. Now, we're going to be much oilier this year. It might not, you know, it's not going to be quite uh, 10%, but much more oil weighted than that revenue, revenue generating commodity, which is what we're looking for. Um, if you take a look at the, the um, production on the, the bottom left chart, you know, that tells you what we're expecting to grow. The blue dots is on a debt adjusted production per share basis. Um, and then you can see, you know, the chart on the bottom, uh, which, which exemplifies 23, 24, 25, and, and the potential production growth uh, into 2025, you know, getting us into mid range there, kind of uh, mid 11,000 BOEs a day in 2025. And we're using, uh, as you can see uh, in the, the WTI price, $80.23, a little bit high now, but I believe it's going to be a strong second half of the year, $75.24 and $70.25. So it's a backward dated, you know, closer to strip type pricing. We continue to see increased funds flow, top right corner in the green throughout that time frame, even though the WTI price, the oil price is dropping. And the bottom screen, um, you get to see the working capital or the net debt in reality um, in 23 is a, a slight net negative debt um, in the purple, um, strong free funds flow in the green, uh, but working our way to cumulative net debt positive close to $70 million in, in 2025 on this longer, to, uh, longer term forecast. Sustainable top tier returns. Again, this is, this is important to us. Um, you know, I, I think you take a look at, um, the top right and the allocation of our adjusted funds flow. The purple, oh, I guess we got three commodity prices, $55, $75, $95 um, for 23, 24, 25. You can see the purple is our CapEx that we're spending through that time frame. The green is our free adjusted funds flow and the orange is our dividends. As you can see, we are sustainable down for the long haul at $55 WTI with a really low leverage ratio. Um, and that doesn't even include at this point cutting back on some of our growth if we get below $60, which probably would be the right thing to do because again, part of the main driver is to, is to show strong returns to the shareholders uh, as, as uh, you know, is what their potential, this is what they're actually asking for right now. 
So the majority of our production comes from a zone called the Cardium. Uh, so if you take a look at the Alberta map in the top right corner, of course, our head office is in Calgary, Alberta. The Cardium is about a two and a half hour drive into uh, the middle of that Williston Green Pemina field. Um, the Pemina Cardium is the oldest, largest conventional light oil pool in Western Canada. It was discovered in the 50s and, and delineated through the 60s and 70s. And, and the, the good quality part of the pool was water flooded, implemented very quickly. Um, billions, uh, well into the teens of billions of oil in place uh, in this pool with relatively low recovery factors. You can see our land base in yellow. Uh, you know, we're going in there and we're drilling on more on the edges of the pool and deeper in many cases where uh, the pool, the oil from the pool was never recovered uh, with vertical wells, but horizontal one mile to two mile wells, or I guess 1.6 to 3.2 kilometer type wells uh, uh, with multi-frax throughout that wells are liberating much more of that oil from uh, the, the reservoir that was never drained uh, in the original uh, type of techn technology and, and vertical production. Williston Green's in the bottom. It's found a little bit later, but it's very similar, you know, delineated through the, the 60s, 70s, and, and 80s. Water flood put in place in the main part of the pool. Um, you can see we have a little bit oilier uh, waiting there in our 5,000 plus barrels of 60% oil and NGLs. And that's specifically, um, you know, why we're going to focus a little bit more on there this year. Um, you know, with one of the great acquisitions we did. Uh, it was a bit gas here, but huge rates over the last few years. It reduced our oil and NGLs to, to about 52% in, in the Pemina Cardium. We have one area, though, that we will drill. Uh, we did drill a couple wells here that came on in, in April, and we're going to drill three more wells. That is very, very high oil weighting in the Pemina area. Bottom In the bottom left, you know, how are we, how are we growing the way we've been growing? Well, it's because we have strong base declines, right from our reserve evaluators report in 23, 26% proved oil producing declines, 18% next year in 24. We drill on top of that. That's why we hover in the kind of high 20s to, to low 30s uh, throughout the year of total decline, a very manageable decline rate with the type of capital we're spending, which doesn't, you know, includes a strong amount of, of free funds flow. So that low production, but low decline production, high net back light oil, quick payout inventory. That's how we're showing top tier light oil growth and sustainability. So Williston Green, I mean, we have a dominant lab position in the, in the main cardium sand here. We have a lot of low risk drilling inventory, um, quick payouts here, generally six months or less, uh, specifically at $80 WTI, um, but still really strong, strong payouts. Over 188 locations here. We have a track record of executing uh, on smart acquisitions here. Prairie Storm is what we closed November 30th at 21. It doubled our land holdings, uh, just about doubled our, our inventory. Uh, lots of contiguous land, so it allows us to drill extended reach wells. So that's, you know, beyond 1.6 kilometers, pushing, uh, you know, up to 3.2 kilometer uh, wells or 2.4 kilometer wells is, is kind of our sweet spot. Um, highly accretive on just about every front. Um, you can see our type curve uh, that we use here as the black dot dashed line. And you can see the wells we've drilled, which includes um, some significant uh, exceeding those wells, specifically in the first six months, which is great because that's what pays the well out. And then we got a nice long low decline tail on these wells. The Peminocardium. Um, Again, lots of low risk, well established uh, infill locations. It's a, um, at, like I say, the oldest field around. Now, strong payouts as well, give or take six, six months or less. 150 plus locations uh, here. In the blue box was the acquisition we did in October of 2020. Uh, $45 WTI. Access to, to, to debt, just about non-existent access to equity very difficult uh, we managed to get 1.9 million from our lenders to purchase 300 BUEs a day we've peaked that high threes a few times now depending on time and drilling um, but like i say strong strong results we had this 100 percent we drilled three wells in the beginning of 2021 we built a full facility to handle the new growth in this 
we drilled another three wells uh, in July, came on in August. Um, basically, we paid the facility, the acquisition costs, and the, the first amount of drilling in about nine, 10 months. Uh, just a, a strong, strong return. In 2021, we purchased this for 1.9 million. In 2021, we did uh, 22 million in cash flow. We did 77 million in cash flow on this in 2022. So again, just a phenomenal acquisition. Um, so again, strong track record in that. And you can see our type curve here uh, in black, um, and you can see our BOE numbers of all of our wells here again. Now, gas year, so higher BOEs day. Um, we don't own the gas infrastructure here, hence why um, with the gas prices that we predicted coming down in 2023, specifically this summer, uh, you know, we, we changed our focus from drilling here. So again, a little less growth occurs, but where we are, we are planning on drilling is going to have a lot more uh, uh, oil and, and natural gas liquids waiting to it which we've talked about a few times here. We drilled two wells up in this area here in the first quarter, and they're spectacular. Um, they've been averaging just under 300 BBs a day since we brought them on in the middle of April, and they're on pump, uh, showing very little decline, and they've been hovering around 80% oil and NGL. So again, uh, we plan on coming back here with three more wells by the end of the year. When you take a look at uh, economics, you know, I mean, the cardium, is a well-established play. It provides some of the best, what I would consider low risk returns in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin. I mean, it's so well delineated geologically with the cardium verticals, with deeper zones, with wells going through it into the deeper zones. So you, you have a strong idea uh, of, of what the boundaries are and what the play looks like. But like, let's just focus on, uh, and we'll talk about the Williston Reed one and a half mile wells. You know, we're at 3.4 million now to drill complete whip tie in, um, you know, it's gone up significantly in the past few years, but at $80 WGI, we're paying out in 0.6 of a year on our type curse, which we tend to be exceeding. So I kind of think, you know, on average about 0.5 times a year, strong rates of returns, um, you know, across the board here. So our forecast right now, so our WGI oil price is $80 to, uh, US per barrel. Um, you know, it's, it's a little high compared to today, today's oil price. I think most of our peers and the analysts still have are using predominantly an $80 price. I mean, we'll reevaluate it in the second half of the year uh, when we come up with our third quarter. But, you know, at $80 WTI, I, again, let's put it in perspective. I believe we're going to have a strong second half of the year, um, specifically because when I take a look at the inventories in the world, they are dropping and they're going to continue to drop here now. A lot of the inventory on this on the water has disappeared. Specifically, Iranian inventory um, in the tankers is, is has now been mitigated. The U.S. is sitting at an oil inventory right in the middle of the five-year average, but distillates and gasoline is below the five-year average. Refiners have been in maintenance season. They're going to have to come on and they're going to have to go like crazy to make, keep up with demand. Of, of gasoline and, and diesel and, and, and heating oils uh, come fall. So you're gonna see, I believe the inventory starting to drop here. And hence you've got OPEC on the throttle who uh, specifically Saudi is in charge of that and, and, and wants to ensure a certain oil price so they can hit their, their targets of their uh, new economy. But we talked about our production, you, know, you get a net back of mid range 37.50 per BOE uh, funds flow mid range of 120 million dollars. You know, capital programs 75 to 80 million, drilling 17 to 18 wells, giving us free funds flow of about 40 million, and uh, you know the dividend about 15, 16 percent. Current share price, you know, that's a free funds flow yield mid range of 17 and a half percent. So ultimately, could we be giving up that 17 and a half percent to our shareholders? Yeah, that could happen. Small working capital. Uh, deficit at the end of the year um, with a leverage ratio of 0 .00, 2 .0, 0 0.2 times. Now, the one thing I'd like to point out, you know, we pay our services, we pay our people in Canadian dollars. We sell our oil in US dollars. Our Canadian dollar used to be very consistent um, and it used to kind of go up and down with oil price. Typically, when we used to have oil prices of, of $80 WCI, you would get 76 to even 
probably 78 to 82 cents a share or 82 cents Canadian dollar on that. When oil's $100, we used to get um, the Canadian dollar being on par one times or even higher than the US dollars. I think in 2014, we hit a high of, we were six cents higher than the US dollar when it was over $100 WTI. Guess what? We've decoupled as a, as a Canadian dollar uh, compared to the, uh, the WTI price. I mean, even last year in Q2, when WTI was $110, our dollar was around 76 cents. That's huge for us. And you can see it at $80 WTI, I'm getting $105 Canadian for my oil at the wellhead. So for the rest of the year, I mean, if you had $5 WTI difference, every $5 WTI is about a $6 million um, loss on our funds flow. And every 50 cents an acre is about a $2 million loss on our funds flow. But again, with our low leverage position, all of, all of our uh, returns to shareholders are very sustainable. On our environmental leadership size, stru uh, side, you know, our inaugural sustainability report was released in, last year in September 2022. It's available on our website. So we put in our 2020 and our 2021 numbers. We've put us up, um, well, I guess more importantly, top left corner. The biggest thing we can do as a, as a light oil conventional producer is reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And we did it. 12% in 18, we did 26% uh, going into 19. Um, of course, through COVID, it was very tough um, showing uh, reductions, um, just lack of capital, it was just survive mode. Um, and then another strong year of 23% reductions in 2021. But when you look at our, when we look at our uh, greenhouse gas emissions versus our peers in the bottom left corner, that's kilograms of CO2 equivalent per barrel of oil equivalent. You know, we're sitting number two in that, in that light oil, uh, conventional peer group of people that have reported. So very, very uh, strong on the environmental, uh, social governance side of our business, uh, as you can attain in our sustainability report. That's it. I mean, we had a great year in 2022, executed on our strategy um, of top tier production per share growth, 59% debt reduction, initiated a dividend and started a share buyback program. Our forecast today um, shows sustainability uh, down to, to very low commodity prices right now. But again, you know, mid range, 120 million, 17.5% um, free funds flow yield, low leverage, and strong production growth. We show that sustainability return to shareholders down to as low as $55 WTI. That occurred for three years. I have a tough time believing that's going to occur for three years. Bottom line, we positioned ourselves to execute on additional and accretive acquisitions with hopefully minimal equity dilution. Um, again, we've done a great job with it before. Uh, you know, we've shown what we can do on these acquisitions and that is, you know, continue, will continue to be a part of our strategy as we move forward. We're fussy though. I mean, we didn't execute on any in 2022 um, because it was a tough year with the high commodity prices and, and, and where the industry sat, uh, you know, as far as expectations on sales. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll end this, uh, um, part of the of the conversation, and, and we can start talking with uh, Jasper here. Thank you for the great presentation, Doug. We'll now move on to the Q and A session, which will be divided into three parts, each of which constitute a pillar of in place investment case. The first is the management and board, where we will discuss Doug's track record, the board's role in in play, and its largest shareholder. We will then move on to the most important pillar, the oil and gas production which will cover each avenue of in-place production. The third and last pillar of the investment case is in-place capital deployment and strategy and revolves around how they are going to use their available capital wisely in order to create material shareholder value. So, Doug, you're an experienced operator in the Canadian oil and gas industry and you're the founder of Inplay, but sort of in your career, what would you? What do you consider to be your greatest achievements? You know what? Um, I've been running a company, you know, since two thousand and five, uh, and you know, I've gone through two really, really difficult time frames. First of all, the financial crisis in two thousand and eight, in the fall, and going into two thousand and nine, uh, and that was a very, very difficult time. Uh, we maneuvered through it. Uh, we got through, you know, all the lending issues with it, uh, the banking crisis. Um, you know what? It was tough. 
uh, we got through it, and ultimately we sold uh, Barrow Energy at a, at a great price in uh, in 2012. Um, secondly, you know, when we started in 13, but really through 14, 15, 16, 17, you know, tough time. But, you know, we managed through it well, showed top tier production growth, so great track record there, um, you know, without, like I said, blowing up the balance sheet. At the time, companies ran with higher leverage. But really, I mean, the, the ultimate biggest achievement was, um, you know, getting through COVID in 2020. Uh, not only did we get through it, we actually, you know, did some smart things that, that put us in the best position I've ever been in any company um, that I've been involved with at an executive level as far as where we sit today, the opportunities in front of us, the balance sheet, the leverage ratios, all that stuff. So, yeah, it's it's a really, uh, uh, you know, those are the achievements, you know, uh, dealing with the lenders through all of that was was a, a difficult piece. I always joke that it was like Fred Astaire has got nothing on me, uh, the tap dance uh, we had to do through uh, through that time frame. But uh, ultimately, it was worth it. Took a few years off my life, but uh, the company's in a much stronger place. If we move on to the board, all of the board members, as you outline in your presentation, have decades of experience in the oil and gas industry. But sort of how active are they in the decision making of InPlay? I mean, I think the board in general is, is um, you know, I think they're, they're doing a, a fabulous job providing uh, sound guidance. Uh, I think they're doing, uh, you know, with their experience level that they have, which is hugely strong in the Canadian oil and gas industry. I mean, I, you know, their active their activeness is 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 cons consistent, and I believe what they should be as as a board level. Again, they get a lot more uh, active on uh, you know depending on the size of the decision and, and the capital allocation. You know, uh, there's a lot more time being spent on there, and particularly with you know the main shareholder being on the board and carbon infrastructure partners, who have a very strong technical team. So you know, they do a lot of work on that on that side. Uh, you know, to uh, uh, you know, walk through their investments. So again, you know, really, really strong uh, leadership right across, uh, right across the uh, uh, the board uh, people that we have. You're by far largest shareholders, carbon infrastructure partner, private equity firm, close to twenty five percent ownership, and they're one board seat. So, so how is your relationship with them? How did they got, got involved in in play, and how active are they in the, in the decision making ultimately? Yeah, so I mean, you know, we sold Vero in late two thousand and twelve. We uh, we started in play, you know, that year, but really tried to get going in thirteen. Tough year for acquisitions. Tough year to raise capital. Um, so we pretty much had to go the private route, and you know, we 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 talked to a lot of private equity firms, and and Jog was the one, which is now Carbon Infrastructure Partners, um, that we uh, that we thought was the best suited for us. Um, you know, we talked to them, we looked at a lot of acquisitions with them. Um, you know, we did some stuff on our own with our own money, but then they came on board in uh, 2014, early with the start of our acquisition program. And you know what they uh, um, added more money in 2016 when we went public. Um, you know, uh, and they've been with us ever since. They have not sold a share. That's they've been. It's been a very very um, favorable, strong relationship, and it, it's gotten better over the years. Uh, just to, in the fact that like uh, public and, and the ups and downs we had, and, and you know they they realize maneuvering that we've been able to do through some very, very tough times, uh, um, you know, uh, so again, I, I, I can't be more pleased with the relationship we have with, uh, with them. We will now move on to the second pillar of InPlace investment case, which is its oil and gas production. We will, with the upcoming questions, investigate how InPlay plans on growing its production through the drill bit. We'll talk about percentage of liquids, crown land auctions, hedging, operating expenses, and more. With that, I would like to move on to the oil and gas production, the, the main component of the of this Q and A session and of, of the investment case for InPlay Oil, and the Q two, as you say, the it's thought th th in the Alberta, but it has been a particular tough quarter with wildfires and production curl payments, especially on the gas side. So approximately, as of now, I think 750 BOE uh, per day, 68% uh, gas is curtailed, uh, curtailed at Pembina and 150 at Wilson Green. So how are you working to resolve these issues? Well, I mean, the uh, the Pembina Act was, or the Pembina curtailment started in right on February 15th of, of the first quarter. 
and um, you know that's uh, down to 750 I think when we announced uh, in the middle of May air quarter and it's going to continue to decline throughout the years um, or throughout the year uh, you know we're working on options there for different takeaway capacity and and uh, um, we're also looking at uh, well the other piece that will happen there is, is declines from us and other partners will continue to, to reduce that curtailment throughout the year um, we expect to have the majority of that all back on production in the fourth quarter right now um, the good piece about that is we we're going to start drilling in there in Q1 in that area, but we decided not to because of its gassy nature and, you know, our view of, of oil or natural gas prices being very poor this summer, uh, which is they are, which is also why we hedged, you know, somewhere between 50 and 55 percent of our, of our gas production at, at favorable rates for the for the summer right now. Um, so that one will resolve itself through the through the year. Uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't change our reserves bookings on them. It just it changes our, our production a little bit through the year and our cash flow. Now, when you take a look at uh, um, the most of the, the production in Willie Green was was brought on once we started our new uh, our first of our two gas plant expansions this year, um, which came on in uh, second early second half of, the, of April. So that production uh, came back on. And then, of course, yeah, the wildfires, uh, which we reported, uh, um, you know, knocked down pretty close to, you know, high 30 percent of our production for, for uh, you know, 90 percent of it for a good solid week, just over a week. And then the last 10 percent took another two, three weeks to uh, to get it all to get the majority of it back on production. Um, so most of that's back on production now uh, as we speak, um, you know, and again, uh, you know, the Pemina area with the gassy uh, area is just a little longer option to, to, you know, the option is just going to take time to uh, put it all together, but it'll set us in a good spot um, moving forward when we figure it out to, to uh, you know, again, to grow that area, which again, I would think we don't want to get there until much stronger natural gas pricing environment. I agree with you. I like that you're quite nimble with how you drill your wells, depending on the on the on the strip pricing and the gas and the eco prices. So, so if you talk about the drilling, you drilled six point five net wells last quarter, uh, and you you said in your presentation that your initial production rates usually exceed your type curves. Uh, how did the initial flow rates compare to the wells that you drilled uh, th thus far? How have they compared to your type curve or, and expectations as well? Well. So, uh, and I, I think, you know, I think all these wells are probably, in, well, are in our presentation on having on the Willis and Green charts now, but, but again, um, you know, we want to put a type curve in that we, we believe we can meet or beat. Um, all these wells in the first 30, 60, 90 days have significantly beat the type curve. And then they start coming closer to the, to the tail of it after, you know, upwards of three months, 90 days. And uh, so they've been strong, strong results. Um, and so on the on our forecast exceeded um and then on our actual reserves um you know hugely exceeded our type curves in the reserve report for the first 90 days typically because we uh you know the reserve the reserve evaluators provide a uh, uh you know some conservativeness in what they put in your undeveloped locations so bottom line is is hugely happy with it we were really happy which i think i mentioned my presentation of the last two wells we drilled in that uh, Pemina area, um, they came on uh, in April, um, high, high oil cuts, um, much lower gas ratio, which we're trying to do um, because the gas, because of the gas, they don't flow as hard off the top. We, we put pumps on them initially very quickly so that we wouldn't have issues with them not flowing during breakup and we couldn't access them. And they've been flat, pretty much flat at 300 BUs a day, you know, hovering initially 90% oil cut, you know, about 80% oil cut. So significantly higher oil cuts than uh, than what we're seeing in the Williston Green area. So we're going to follow that up quite quickly. Uh, well, quite quickly, but this fall, um, we're looking at doing at least another three wells in that area. Could you just walk us through the drilling program for, for this year or the, the rest of the drilling program, uh, so distribution between Wilton Green, Pembin and, and so on? Yeah, so, I mean, we currently have three wells that... Um, we're putting on, uh, or that we've, we've drilled over the first quarter into the second quarter. Um, they're sitting there, they're waiting for completion. Um, we're waiting for on access to that right now, uh, a little bit later than we were hoping uh, due to the county not allowing us to move equipment. But uh, I believe in the next week, we should be on there completing those wells. 
we should start drilling another three well pad, and that's in Williston Green, another three well pad in Williston Green. Um, maybe the end of the month, again, depending on access, move, so everything, services, uh, maybe start late in June or at minimum early July. So then those three wells will uh, be completed, give or take by the end of July on production, hopefully about the middle of uh, uh, August. And then around, you know, that first few weeks of August, uh, you know, towards the middle of August, we expect to have our second gas uh, plant expansion uh, started up and ready to go pretty close to the timing of bringing on the, the next three wells there. Um, and then again, we're looking at another uh, three well, could be a little bit more, maybe four wells in the, that oilier area back in Pemina. And then and then we have some different opportunities, uh, you know, back in Williston Green we'd look at, or um, potentially another Belly River or two Belly River wells, uh, which we don't talk about too much, but we drilled two at the end of the year last year that uh, again, I, hugely exceeded our expectations. We used technology. We haven't drilled in there since 2018, uh, well, actually 17 and into early 18. And um, we used some of the new technology that we've been using in the cardium there. And again, uh, sizable, uh, it, sizable bead on our type curves and uh, our reserves. So that's a very, again, very high quality light oil uh, area, typically 90 percent plus uh, light oil. It's actually a, better, a little bit better quality than, uh, than the cardium oil. I know you already have guidance for 2024 and 2025, but I just would like to hear your opinion. So, I mean, you're guiding, you're roughly in the sort of roughly 58, uh, 58%, 61% uh, liquids. Is that sort of, of course, it depends on the gas prices, but if you're thinking one, two years out, is that something that you would, you would like to stick to that or would you even sort of even increase that uh, percentage come from from uh, angels and, and uh, crude oil? I think in our area, it's hard to get a whole lot above that. There's a few guys that might be 63% if you're, you know, high weighted to the cardium. Uh, but in general, that seems to be, you know, the average at best is in that 60% range of, of oil and natural gas liquids, just due to the nature of the, the solution gas that, that, that comes with the property. Um, and again, the solution gas is the driver. That, that also allows you to flow at the rates we flow in the beginning and things like that. But uh, that seems to be the, the the give or take the 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 most logical scenario. I mean, we can grow production faster if we drill some gas areas because typically you you can see in the Pemina slides the BOE per day is is higher. But again, it's higher because of the gas. Um, but it just doesn't make a lot of sense to, to again back to grow production um, with a commodity that's not generating you as much revenue. Um, in a, in the you know in that lower pricing environment, so so we have a lot of ability to move things around there, and, and like I say, we try and make sure we do the the right and the smart things. Talking about how nimble you are, I mean, say that gas prices spike in December this year, and you would like to drill more gas concentrated wells. How fast can you sort of react, drill the wells, and then get it to the market? Well, it, you know, it, <laughs> there's a lot to that. Like it just depends on how far in advance we are in things. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of those locations have already been surveyed because we were planning to start drilling there in Q1, which we pulled back. So the, the survey and, and and stuff has been done. Then you got to acquire land. I mean, it, it's very complicated in the fact that if you acquire crown land, which is kind of interesting, that's government owned land. It's actually slower than if you acquire, usually slower than if you acquire land that's owned by, uh, um, you know, uh, landowners. Uh, so, so it, you know, just there's all sort of parts of different parts of that puzzle. Um, but in general, like it can be anywhere from one to three months. And if you have the odd issue a little bit longer than that. Nice. And the, by, by the way, speaking of crown and freehold land, how, uh, what's the percentage for you? Wow. This is surface locations. Oof. I would say we're two thirds, um, landowners freehold land now that's this is surface land we're talking about and about a third crown but the, just about you know 95 percent of our actual mineral rights is crown which is a good thing and we didn't talk about that in the presentation but the alberta government has a plan in place and uh, you know um depending on your efficiency um and uh, you know how, how efficient you are in drilling completions which i think we're in our peer group uh, and in our cardium are at the top of that. You know, we get 5% crown royalties um, based on the capital we spend on a designated payout. 
So, I mean, at $60, we we're getting over two years of 5% royalties. And, uh, you know, at 70, 80, you're, you know, you're starting to get, uh, you know, give or take a year. There was actually wells last year that we drilled in the late Q1, Q2, that that 5% royalty with $100 oil was paying out in four, six, four to six months. Absolutely. You know, we used 5% in that quick time frame, and then we went back to normal royalties. So, that is a big boon for us when you consider like most of the guys in the States, it's just about all freehold mineral rights and the guys in the Permian and all that, they're typically paying 22% plus a state mineral tax. So generally they're paying 25% royalties from day one to the end of life. I am by any means no expert on the crown and the freehold land and, and royalties that are applicable to those. But if I understand right, you get the 5% royalty for five years and then it's adds up to sort of oh, 25% or uh, whatever it is. Is that true? Well, no, it's not five years. It's, 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 it, and it'll, it'll depend on, again, on the commodity price. I mean, if it's high commodities, it pays out a lot quicker. So last year we had some that paid out in four to six months. When we were down in the $60 range, most of it was like two, two and a half years of 5% royalty. So it, it, again, it, it, it's very, it's, it's kind of your capital, um, you know, at higher commodity prices, we're paying out quicker. It's 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 about your capital intensity. You know, it's it's quite a well done program in general. Um, but uh, you know, that's how it that's how it works. And then, you know, again, our royalties with the crown is always uh, related to oil price and the production rate of the well. So the lower the rate, as the well gets older, the lower the rate, a little lower royalties. And of course, the higher the commodity price, uh, the government gets a better. A higher share of the uh, of the royalty payments. Once the well is paid out, th then the the higher royalty rate uh, starts to apply. If if I correct. How, how many of the, the wells that you're drilling this year are unbooked, sort of more exploration wells? Uh, I mean, so far as we know, uh, I think there's one or two, and then sec secondly, like um, you know, our, our we use one of the, there's three, I would call major um, uh, reserve evaluators uh, in Canada. You know, we use one of the top reserve evaluators. We do 100% of our re reserves are uh, evaluated externally. They got very high or high tight standards that they go by. And, uh, you know, they only give you so much undeveloped locations and, uh, you know, uh, according to the handbook that they use and the standards. So a lot of times when we drill wells, like it'll it'll add extra wells on top of that, um, just based on the fact of of uh, uh, you know they'll only give us so many on the start. So that's that's how that all works. On your current land package, so beyond the current locations that are booked, what potential do you see at Wilson and Green and Pembina to expand the number of, of booked drill locations? I mean, typically we're kind of in that, we're, we're typically booked like 50 to 66%, you know, half to two thirds is kind of what we're booked. So there's, you know, depending on a few things, 50 to, uh, um, sorry, yeah, 50 to 33 to 50%, you know, unbooked locations. Um, but we're still, you know, at the pace we're drilling in general, like we have, multi years of, of drilling inventory, uh, you know, to, to maintain, uh, the sustainability of the company and, and, uh, but we're always looking to increase, you know, that sustainability and, and, uh, uh you know, increase our funds flow and our free funds flow. By the way, if we move back to uh, crown land and freehold land for, for that matter as well, how active are you currently in the, in the auctions, in the, in the bidding process? I mean, you know what? Very selective. I mean, in our producing areas, there's not a lot of crown land for sale. So what happens is um, most of the land is held by production, whether it's say it's in the cardium zone, but it could actually be held because it was purchased as a package with a lower zone, usually not very often a higher zone that was was purchased, but with a lower zone, it could be held if there's production in, in a deeper zone. So um, there's not a lot, um, but we have every year been active a little bit. In fact, we did buy some crown land um, or, or we did, sorry, we did buy some land in the first quarter, a little bit of land this year as well. So uh, every year changes, you know, what's available, what comes up. If you would like to sustain your current production of roughly 9,500, 10,000 barrel, barrels of oil equivalent per day, how many wells, and let's talk about 0.5 uh, mile horizontal wells, how many wells would you have to drill per year? And what would that equate to in terms of capex, sustaining capex? So, I mean, in general, you know, we estimate it to be about 11 to 13 wells. Um, 
you know, depending on the length, depending on the area, the depth, all the different pieces um, is, is what it would sustain. I mean, again, um, if, if it was gas here, you'd be lower on that, you know, whether you're a little higher on that. So, you know, uh, it's, I guess, to answer the question, you know, that's, that's the number. I mean, you know, and if you just assume that, that, you know, it's, it, over that range and if you know i assume a bit of a mix you know it's 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 in that 45 to 50 million dollars range of, of capex great yeah i actually wrote it down because i'm i'm currently doing the this kind of free cash flow model for in place so i will need that later uh <laughs> anyway anyways so could you I mean, of course, your production is on the oil price, but could you just broadly outline if the WTI sticks at seventy dollars per barrel, if it were, if, uh, and in a scenario that it would go to ninety, one hundred dollars per barrel, what sort of production rates we could see? I mean, you know, with our new strategy, and with again the model that most people are using now, um, that you know, with basically sustainable returns to shareholders, return on capital employed. All of this was not happening in this industry for many years. It was growth. I mean, from the U.S. to go from eight to 13 million barrels, they spent two and a half, three times their cash flow to get there. Well, guess what? People aren't giving us that type of type of capital anymore. Um, equity debt isn't as easy. Equity is not, is not inexpensive these days with where we trade at. Debt has become a little bit difficult, more difficult after the um, the COVID uh, event. Um, lenders are tighter on that. So, but in the meantime, like Bay Street, Wall Street have asked for a return to shareholders. Um, free funds flow, one of the main common terms. When we look at things, free funds flow is at the top of the chart. Uh, so I, in my mind, um, you know, if we're 60, 70, we're at the lower end of that, six percent guidance um you know production per share growth with the size of the company we are today and our declines in our inventory if it's eighty dollars 70 80 we're looking at the you know uh more like the eight to ten percent area in that range um if it goes above that i don't i don't foresee a scenario that we get more aggressive our declines are sustainable the way they are if we go ninety to hundred dollars i think it's a great time to pay down debt and to look at returning more to the shareholders. Um, to increase capital spending, I'm not sure the service industry could handle everybody increasing their um, capital by 25% even. Um, the, the industry was decimated, the service side, you know, through COVID, and it hasn't returned to those levels. And, and these guys got beat up really bad too, and they're very selective on putting capital into new equipment, and you know they've had a tougher time hiring people back. So, um, due to the volatility and the ups and downs of that service side, people working and not working. So that's a part of the problem. Um, but ultimately, I, just the shareholders are not asking for that. I, I, that's your time when you have a little bit of higher oil price and your debt runs up a little bit. That's your time to lower your debt. That's the time to increase return to shareholders. And ultimately, I believe we're going to be in that price range that you talked about. And uh, you know, that's just going to be a great time for everybody. Well, great, great to hear that. Yeah. Even in, in a scenario of significantly higher oil price, that you would for folks on re return to shareholders other than sort of I don't know, drilling and having a 40 percent decline per year which is yeah well let me like and that's right like let me add to that like i mean i've been there we've done that as a junior company uses good pricing eighty dollars ninety dollars hundred dollars uh four dollar gas you have all this cash flow and we used to be able to just drill and grow like crazy the problem is you'd have 40 45 percent declines and also an oil goes to 60 or 50. gas goes to you know 250 an MCF or maybe a buck 50 an MCF. We had under $2 many years. Also, I don't have enough cash flow to stay flat, right? And and it's a tough, that was a tough way to run the business and, um, you know, not an efficient way to run the business. And, you know, it's as a shareholder, like, why would you want to hold that when you know that they can't even stay flat in production and, and the revenue is off? This is a much more consistent, smart way to run the business and, and to see where we're going to go uh, as, as an industry forward. Like the discipline has been amazing as far as not spending all the free funds on cash flow, on paying down debt, on returns to shareholders. Like it's pretty much across the board. There's very few guys that are just growth, growth driven right now. And, and you know, the statistics are showing that if you're all about growth, you're not getting, in most cases, the highest returns. The, you know, the highest share price, the highest, uh, uh, you know, spot to be in there.
regarding your assets in the in the card information, you produce light light and sweet oil. Could you just give the, tell the viewers the, what differential you approximately have uh, compared to the WTI? Yeah, so I mean, um, we sell um, what they call MSW, which is mixed sweet blend. Other people have called it Edmonton Par. And in reality, it's very close to WTI um, as far as quality. Um, it's, it's, it has a slight discount uh, of, a, of a couple dollars um, of to it. But more importantly, uh, there's a, a MSW differential. And it's kind of been hovering between 2 and $3 the last two years uh, off of WTI. So 2 and $3 US off of WTI. Uh, sometimes spiked into the threes and sometimes spiked into the ones, but that's where it's been hovering. And to be honest, it looks like where it's going to hover quite a bit going forward. I mean, we're not growing light crude in Canada, uh, basically at all. We we can grow WCS, Western Canadian Select, which is the heavier blend. Um, oil sands can grow it, even though they're not just about done growing because of lack of takeaway. And, um, you know, some of the other plays that are quite popular right now have a uh, like the Clearwater are uh, um, on a on a WCS discount, which is again much harder, higher. Today it's WCS is twelve dollars, twelve to fourteen dollars. It's been kind of hovering on a on a US differential uh, basis, and last year it was as high as twenty five to thirty, you know, just under thirty dollars at times. The, the the Western Canadian select uh, the heavier blend, and that doesn't even include the cost, the diluent that's required to put into it to um, for it to flow on the pipelines typically to uh, the U.S. Midwest and, and the Gulf Coast. You also have, a, I think, sort of 16% of your reserves are, are natural gas liquids. So could you just explain to the viewers what your na- natural la- gas liquids primarily consist of and what price, pricing that applies to them? That's a very complicated question. I'm going to try and do this as, as uh, simple as I can. But, but basically, um, so natural gas liquids generally combines um, ethane, so, of course, natural gas straight is methane, but it, 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 it's ethane, propane, butane, pentanes, which is C5+, plus, and condensate. Um, now, uh, depending what kind of facility you go into, a deeper cut facility will cut a lot of those, more of those products out, and you can get a, a wider suite. Pentanes and condensate, which are generally lower in the stream, but those are valued at typically WTI and even in a premium to WTI. Like that's used in a lot of the diluent uh, required to move heavy oils, uh, um, you know, to the States. Um, the rest, the rest can swing all over the place, protein, propane, butane, and ethane, they can swing quite a bit. Um, but bottom line, in the end, it tracks WTI. And, you know, over the last two years, we've been pretty much hovering at about as a blended um, liquid space, 40 to 45% of WTI. So, I mean, at $100, we're getting 40 to $45. Still a lot better than gas price, even if you use a, a six to one conversion, right? You know, you're, you're getting, uh, uh, you know, $8, seven, $8 MCF equivalent. So, uh, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a bigger part of, uh, of the equation. And, and the nice thing about it is like, when you transporting to a lot of these facilities, you know, natural gas just kind of pays for the transportation costs, but the liquids are where you, you actually make money. Well, regarding transportation costs, if we speak about operating expenses, you're guiding for roughly, I think, $12, $15 per barrel oil equivalent per day this year. And that, uh, of course, the unit cost is dependent on the production. But so what, what are you seeing uh, in terms of inflationary pressures or, and how you're mitigating them would be my follow-up question. Well, I, I think we, uh, we've seen the inflationary pressures uh, p- pretty much peaked right now. Um, you know, along the way, I mean, fuel costs have, have come down from the highs. Um, just, you know, in general, uh, you know, I think the wage inflation is, is kind of peaked. Now, with that said... Uh, you know, just to stay relatively flat from where we were in 21, I think is is uh, you know just a testament to to the team out there and the operations group on the ability to uh, you know be efficient and, and keep the cost flat on a dollar per BV basis because um, you know we've been able to do that. You know, if in theory, if we didn't have that inflationary, we would have um, we would have been probably close. You know down 15% on a BV basis from where we are today. But 
you know, ultimately it's the commodity prices that have, you know, reduced our debt and allowed the, the uh, um, return to shareholders, um, you know, so a dollar or two of per BOE uh, on an operating basis in a, in a higher commodity price environment is, is something we can manage. I mean, of course, higher prices result in higher royalty rates generally, but how sensitive are you to higher commodity prices? I mean, um, so last year, I think we averaged just under 95, you know, and our royalty rate was 16, 17% of the revenue. Um, so, I mean, let's say a hundred, so you're, you say you're $17. Um, so 17%, you know, of that revenue was $17 a barrel. You know, when we used to be in that $60 range, 55, 60, we were kind of between eight and a half to 10%, right? So, uh, you know, it comes down substantially um, as you go lower. Uh, you know, I can remember, uh, you know, when oil was, you know, 30, $40 in 2020, I mean, our royalty rate was below 5%, right? So, uh, well, it's 5% or give or take. So quite a bit, quite a bit lower as well. So gives you kind of a wide range of, of what to expect there. I mean, you know, it's kind of, it's like a, uh, you know, a, uh, GST or PST or whatever. It's like, you know, the more, the more you pay, the higher, the more expensive the, uh, the product, the higher tax you pay sort of thing. And it's not, not it's not a whole lot different on the, what the government takes, uh, on that side. You want to buy a million dollar home or whatever, you, you know, you're going to pay more than you are in a hundred thousand dollar home. I mean, moving on to the hedges, I mean, you have no hedges for your oil production, despite having a small portion of debt, but you have, you have a, hedge, a fair share of your gas production. So what's your, what's your, how do you view hedging? So, uh, I mean, the best hedge is a strong balance sheet. And we've, we've got the best balance sheet of any company I've ever been involved with. And I mean, I, you know, I can say this with like helping me sleep a night a ton that, you know, with, with the leverage ratios we're running at, uh, I sleep good at night and I've never been involved with a company that in this strong a financial position, um, just not the way we used to run our business, but that is the way we're going to run going forward. Um, after that, we become opportunistic. You know, we had some pretty good, uh, um, uh, you know, intelligence last late last fall that like natural gas was looking really scary for 2023 and, and maybe longer. Um, but the summer was looking really poor. Um, you know, I expect it to be hovering in the you know, Canadian in the mid dollar range for at some of these months. So we have like 50, 55 percent of our gas hedged at, uh, you know, three seventy three uh, a gigajoule or closer to four dollars at MCF. So great spot. Um, so, again, they're very opportunistic on that front. Now, on the oil side, like. You know, again, it's a fine line. Um, if, if we do some deals and we lever up a little higher than we are, we're going to hedge, um, protect uh, the free funds flow, protect the capital program, um, you know, protect bringing that debt back down to, you know, below 0.5 times in a short period of time frame. And ultimately, you know, increasing free funds flow um, or the return to shareholders. So, I mean, that's generally how we look at, at the hedging Um uh, as we see today, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of a tough one where, where, you know, a lot of guys, um, a lot of guys, uh, you know, would, are the reason why we're trading a lower multiples today as an industry is because I think nobody knows where oil is going and, and the sustainability of a higher oil price with, you know, all the noise, the, the recession fears and everything else, potential demand destruction. Ultimately, most recessions, the demand destruction is a lot smaller than of oil that everybody, um, you know, that normally would that, that normally the people think is going to occur and they generally have you know they go over pretty quick so you got people sitting on the sidelines not knowing when to get in but, but i believe that'll change uh, fairly quickly so these people are waiting for higher oil prices and more sustainable oil prices which ultimately will increase uh, what i believe are trading multiples on a, on a cash flow basis to more historical levels we have now arrived at the third pillar of in-place investment case which is capital deployment and strategy where we will inquire Doug about in-place acquisitions plans and how they plan on deploying the regenerated free funds flow. We will also talk about Doug's vision for in-play. Well, you mentioned that you might uh, lever up in, in, in the case of an acquisition and uh, you have done a fair share of, of successful acquisitions in the past. 
But as of now, how active are you looking for uh, inorganic growth? You know what? We're, uh, we're continually looking um, for an acquisition. Again, nothing was done in 2022. Um, again, a very difficult time to do acquisitions. You didn't see a lot of small ones. They were predominantly big acquisitions um, with big companies with significant access to debt. Um, so, you know, I guess bottom line in 2022, the high prices made it difficult to do deals. Of course, the, the seller thinks we should be running $100 WGI in our numbers. And we're like, well, next year's strip is $85. We can't run, can't run uh, the future prices way lower. So we're not going to run that. So you didn't see a lot of these, a lot of deals done. I think as we get some stability, uh, there's still a lot of packages that will need to sell and, and things for sale from the private side and, and other pieces uh, out there that you're going to start seeing more and more M&A. And, and we're looking at stuff constantly. It's a, it's part of, uh, uh, you know, strong organic growth coupled with uh, uh, with acquisitions, we believe is, is one of the, the best ways to uh, to continue to smartly grow our business and, and increase our, uh, our uh, uh, free funds flow of return to shareholders. Regarding acquisitions, uh, of course, every acquisition is different, but do you have a, some sort of target profile in terms of size and does it have to be in the accordion formation necessarily? Could you add some color to that? Yeah, I mean, you know, for size, I, you know, I think we have the opportunity to do lots of different sizes. I mean, potentially you could do uh, as high as uh, if it's the right acquisition, you know, doubling our company in one deal. Um, but in the same light, uh, uh, it doesn't have to be in the cardio. There are opportunities in cardio, but it, it, it can be elsewhere. Uh, we do want to stay oil focused. Um, we believe, you know, as a smaller company, that's a, it's a, it's a stronger path. Um, you know, just, there's lots of natural gas out there. You can drill quickly and add a lot of natural gas. Then you got to deal with facilities and, and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a much bigger company game in our mind than, than a small company uh, game. Um, but th those are the, the things that we're looking at. We're, we typically look strongly at uh, accretion on most scenarios. And, and I think most cases we can get that. The one I don't like, uh, the one the, one of the most important pieces is, is free, to me, is free funds flow. Um, is it accretive on free funds flow? You know, that's a driver. That's, a, that's your sustainability. That's your return to shareholders piece. Well, regarding if you would like to stay in Cardium, I, I didn't get that. Would you like to stay in Cardium or could you, for example, uh, consider move out to, I don't know, Saskatchewan or uh, the Clearwater? Yeah, no, I mean, we would consider uh, getting another core area. Um, uh, you know, um, I, again, just on that front, uh, light oil focused and sustainable is, is or, or uh, um, you know, free funds flow sustainability is, is the key in those type of acquisitions. You're about to renew your credit facility, which of course is an important comp component if you would like to do an acquisition. Will the same terms apply in terms of such an in interest rate? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, yeah, we're just finalizing it. I mean, the terms will be um, similar to last year. Some of them will be more favorable. I mean, as far as interest rates on our typical fe lending facility, like uh, it, it's driven by the amount of leverage you have, but more importantly, it, it's driven by, um, you know, a floating rate, which give or take is prime, the prime rate. So, I mean, the actual interest rate is higher this year than it was, you know, most of last year, just due to the, um, the you know, the, the banks, uh, increase the Bank of Canada, the Fed increasing interest rates with the inflation. But when you have um, low on a dollar per BB basis, it's actually lower just because of, of uh, um, the, the amount of debt we're actually using on the credit facility right now. So, um, all in all, it's it's actually you know still a strong axis of cost you know of cost of capital right now compared to probably you know issuing too much equity. Yeah, what approximately one hundred ten million in your, in your credit facility. So, so you're you would rather in the case of a little bit of a larger acquisition, you you would rather use that instead of issuing equity. Yeah, I, I, there would be both. There would be both, right? I mean, I, I, you're not going to just get away with one or the other. I think you know you'd use either or um, in the, uh, uh, or either or, you use both, but I get a little bit heavier weighted to, uh, to um, uh, you know, the debt side right now as we see it. And it's actually amazing, like, you know, with anything we look at, we, 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 we stay, you know, give or take one or below, and within two quarters, we tend to be below 0.5 times um, uh, 
that the, that they've been out again. So, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to over lever. Um, and again, we'll, we'll hedge accordingly to, uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, we get back to a level that allows us to return more to the shareholders in a, in a really uh, short basis. And in the meantime, we don't, you know, we don't expect any changes to our current, uh, um, return to shareholder program through it all. Everything we model, uh, has that staying in it. Great. Regarding return to shareholders, that was actually what what my next go question was targeting. Because okay, you you quite recently instituted a sustainable dividend. That current share price is roughly seven to seven and a half percent dividend yield, but you're only well only only pay, paying out uh, sixteen million Canadian, and your free funds flow depending on the WTI is well three times that. So, uh, in some cases, I think you're guiding for what 37 to 48 million Canadian this year. Anyways, how are you looking to deploy your generated free cash flows? How are you thinking in terms of increased dividends, drilling, share buybacks? Yeah, I mean, ultimately increased free funds flow. You know, I, I, it'd be a combination of, of share buybacks and, and, and dividend increases. I mean, we do have a high weighting towards retail um, investors, uh, which should, and tend to like like the dividend payments. Um, you know, institutions sometimes like uh, uh, share buybacks, more share buybacks. Um, but ultimately, you know, I like to use that clean balance sheet to get bigger. I think getting bigger is important. I think we'll get more eyeballs on us, more institutions on us. Um, so, so that's a big part of the strategy to use the pristine balance sheet uh, for for that uh, that getting uh, getting bigger. Um, and uh, you know, and ultimately, like I say, it's like everything we we look towards is, is increasing our return to shareholders. So. That, that's how we look at it, keeping the debt, the leverage low. Nice. Sounds like uh, we in the near future could expect a um, higher payout ratio, perhaps, uh, including the buybacks. <laughs> I hope so. I, I, I enjoy seeing that. that come in every month. That was actually my second last question. So now I would actually like to ask you the final question, which which is most suitable to you, not only because you're CEO, but but you're also the founder uh, of Inplay Oil and and the heavy shareholder. So where do you envision Inplay Oil in five years? <laughs> I mean, you know, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I, I I see us growing to be a one to two billion dollar company in the next five years, um, with low leverage, strong free funds flow. I mean, ultimately. I believe that'll get us purchased somewhere along the way um, as you're going to see less new growth oil properties, still strong demand required for energy. You're going to see um, strong commodity prices, less growth. Uh, you're going to see less companies and the larger companies are going to have to go after um, the smaller ones. Uh, especially if it's very strong, free cash flow accretive, because that's going to be one of the biggest drivers for everybody in the end is to uh, is to uh, um, provide return to shareholders for for years to come. I, you know, ultimately, um, you know, like I say, we want to get sizably bigger. We want to sell. Uh, we we're, we'll look to sell at the appropriate time, and and there'll be more competition as there's less companies uh, for sales and less less opportunity to purchase things as you get less and less companies and less and less uh you know fields 